This lecture is going to help us learn how to assign the electronic transitions as well as calculate delta octahedral for transition metal complexes. And we'll begin by looking at this vanadium, hexa aqua vanadium 3 complex shown here. And what we're given is the UV visible spectrum of this complex. Um, take note of your axes in this case. We have um, nanometers on the x axis as well as wave numbers. Um, and we can see in this case, we have higher wave numbers on the left, lower wave numbers on the right. And so we see energy is increasing as you go from left to right. And then the Y axis is extinction coefficient. Um, so we can pull information directly out about the type of electronic transition as we talked about in the last lecture, um, directly from the peak height and extinction coefficient. I've also pulled the tanabe sugano diagram for a D2 metal complex. So D2, because this is vanadium 3 plus, so there's two D electrons, and we can utilize this diagram to answer a lot of questions about these transitions that we're seeing. A couple of those transitions. Um, first, what is the ground state term? Second, what transitions do we expect to observe and can we assign the electronic transitions? So these are the electronic transitions that we want to be able to assign. Um, and we're gonna do that using the Tanabe Sugano diagram. So first, what is the ground state term? So the, our diagram on the right will give us this ground state term um, immediately. We can see that in the free iron, the ground state term is a triplet F but in a crystal field with ligands around the vanadium, as in this case, the ground state term will be this triplet T1G. That means all of the transitions we see will be starting in the triplet T1G state, and they will then be excited to a higher energy state. Now, in order to predict what those transitions will be for those higher energy states, we have to remember our selection rules. And if you remember, with the selection rules. Um, the key one that we're looking for is the spin multiplicity has to be conserved. And so we see we're starting with a triplet state. And so if we start with this ground state triplet T1G, our lowest energy transition then is gonna be to the triplet T2G. And this would be our lowest energy transition. We can see there's a possibility of other transitions coming in. We could also have a transition that goes to the triplet T1G. And we could have a further third transition that would go to the triplet A2G. Those are our three possible transitions. Notice the Tanabe Sugano diagram. In this case, the spin multiplicities, the lines of the same spin multiplicity are solid, and the dashed lines are going to different spin multiplicities. Um, so those would be the three transitions. We see we only see two peaks. Um, in this case, it turns out that this last transition that goes to the triplet A2G is too high in energy. So that's gonna be located somewhere over here and we're not seeing it in the UV vis spectrum. Um, so that does allow us to assign these two peaks as to be these first two transition. Um, and we can see, we can show that here, I've tried to illustrate our lowest energy transition triplet T1G to triplet T2G. The next one is triplet T1G to triplet T1G. And then we have triplet T1G to the triplet A2G. So those would be the three possible transitions, two of which we can see on the diagram above. Now, the second question we have is why are these peaks so broad? We've answered this before, so hopefully um, you remember this, but um, remember we said we're dealing with these complexes, the broadness of these UV vis peaks has to do with, to the molecular vibrations. Um, the molecules are constantly moving and that's changing the energy levels just slightly, but that change in energy level means instead of getting a discrete wavelength for a lambda max, we're gonna get a wide distribution of peaks at slightly different energies um, because of these transitions. If we look at some Tanabe Sugano diagrams in the back of your textbook or online, um, a couple things to take note of is one thing you see is in the case of D4 through D7, when you look at the diagrams, you actually see a dis, um, 
a break in the diagram. And so in this one here, we're looking at a D6 complex. And in our D6 complex, we see we start off with the quintet D ground state. Um, but if we read the diagram, halfway through the diagram, you have this break in the diagram. And we can say, what's going on here? Well, what's happening here is we see the break between a high spin to a low spin complex. This is the difference between a weak field and strong field. And so we actually see when we get to the right of the diagram, the ground state changes. And here our ground state is singlet A1, showing that change in multiplicity from the change in your field. So we start off with a weak field complex, and then we end up with a strong field complex. And if we look at the electron configurations, in the first case, we have a quintet state because we have four unpaired electrons. And in the second case, um, we have a singlet state because all the electrons are paired because of the increase in delta octahedral. So the last thing we want to learn how to do is to determine what delta octahedral is. Um, this is not always easy, especially if there's overlapping peaks. Um, we're going to look at a couple, two different cases in this lecture. We will look at the simplest case where we have a D1 complex, a D9 complex would be very similar. And then we'll look at the more complicated case where you have more than one D electron and learn the steps of how to go through and find the delta octahedral. So for a D1 complex, we can first start off with this titanium three. This is a D1 complex. And we can say, here's our UV visible spectra. We want to determine what is delta octahedral. The first thing we need to do is we need to assign the electronic transition. And here we have to remember if we have a D1 complex, we have to go back to our correlation diagrams. There is no tanabe sugano diagram for a D1 complex. Um, so we have to remember that the transition in a D1 complex is simply doublet T2G going to doublet EG. And here it is shown um, based on the electron configurations. We're exciting this electron in the T2G set to an electron in the EG set. Um, here's the correlation diagram would look something like this, where we just go that doublet D term splits into doublet T2G going up to doublet EG. And then delta octahedral is the gap here. So in this very simplistic case, delta octahedral is directly the energy lambda max of our peak, because this transition represents the jump from a T2G electron to an EG with no other electrons present to influence those energy levels. So our delta octahedral is approximately 21,000 wave numbers read right off of our UV vis spectra. How do we explain that double hump? So the other thing we should be able to do is explain why we have a little shoulder and why we have a double hump. Um, and I'll leave you to review your notes from previous lectures to remind yourself how we can interpret that. So how do we find delta octahedral if we have a more complex system such as that vanadium complex we started off looking at. Um, this is a D2 complex. We now see we have two electronic transitions present here. So how do we actually go about finding delta octahedral? Um, what we're going to want to do is pull up the Tanabe Sugano diagram for a D2 complex. So I have one here. Um, we need to assign the peaks. We did that before. Um, and then we need to find what is the lambda max of those two peaks. So we need to come down and say, what is lambda max for each of our two peaks? And when I did it, I found that lambda max to be 1,700 wave or 17,000 wave numbers and 25,600 wave numbers. Using those in conjunction with our Tanabe Sugano diagram, we're going to be able to find out what delta octahedral is. And so we can do this, and here are the steps. I'll show you the steps, and then we'll walk you through an example using these steps. What we're going to do is first find a ratio of lambda max of these two peaks. So we're going to divide the wave numbers of these two peaks to find a ratio. We're going to assign these electronic transitions on our Tanabe-Sugano diagram 
then we're going to find where that initial ratio of peaks is on the based on the y values of lines on our Tanabe Sugano diagram. We'll then use those to find out what B is and calculate an average value of our RACA parameter. And then once we know that, we can go ahead and calculate delta octahedral. So let's start off. The first thing we'll do is take a ratio of peaks. So that's fairly straightforward. We just come down and say the first peak was at 25,600 approximately, and the second peak is 17,200. And so our ratio is about one and a half. And if we had real data with software, we could find lambda max much more accurately than sort of just tracing down, but the idea holds. So now that we have this ratio, the next thing that we want to do is we want to assign transitions on the Tanabe Sugano diagram. And so these two transitions, the 25,600 and the 17,200, those correspond to a trans transitions from the triplet T1G to triplet T2G, and the second transition goes from the ground state to the triplet T1G. So those are the two transitions, in this case, V1 and V2 that we were looking at. So what we want to do is find a place on the diagram where the ratio of these lines is one and a half. We're looking for that ratio um, of our peaks. And so if we do this, we can look and see approximately in this place right here, the 39 divided by 26 is approximately one and a half. So where do those come from? So here's the 39 and here's the 26, reading the y-axis value. And what this does is this sets our location of where we are on the x-axis. So this is where we are on the x-axis at this spot here. We can now use these values that we got for our y-axis values. Remember, this value is equal to E over B. And so we can use that to solve for B. We know this is the y value. E, in this case, would be the 25,600. And in this case, E is the 17,200. So we can use that to calculate what B is. And so when I did it, we have two values of B. We have 661 and 656 wave numbers. Once we have our average value of B, we can average those two, and then we can simply come down here, and remember, we know where we are in the x-axis, right down here, we can figure out what that is, and the x-axis units are delta octahedral over B, but we now have a value of B, so we can plug that in. So I said we were at 28 on the x-axis, we now know what B is from our average, so we can substitute that in, and we can now calculate and determine what our delta octahedral is. And in this case, I got delta octahedral to be 18,600 wave numbers. These steps would work for any system other than D1 and D9, which you can read directly, um, as long as you sort of walk through it and find the right places um, on your diagrams. So that concludes our lecture of how to find delta octahedral for a transition metal complex. Um, if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you.